Greetings, friend. I will show you an ironclad Sudoku rule that will feel illegal to you, but it will help you solve this puzzle much faster. And with that, it's solving time. I'm going to start by applying set equivalence theory to the starting grid, just like I did with the first two Friday puzzles of this month. The way this grid is set up, though, it seems a little hard to separate starting digits into two distinct color groups of cells. But what if I told you that this puzzle you're looking at is the same as this one? This puzzle right here is what Bondi actually gave me. Thank you so much, Bondi, for helping me with these set puzzles. This is the perfect puzzle to discuss the idea of the little known Sudoku rule. It's called the rule of symmetry. Okay, now if you saw my previous videos, you noticed that by looking right here in this block of the other puzzles, you see that the 1379s are clumped nice and together. And then if you go across these rows, you can capture 2, 4, 6, and 8. So you create two different distinct sets of the digits. 1, 3, 7, 9, 2, 4, 6, and 8 into these two colored grids. Okay, so that's a little easier to see because you've seen it in two other puzzles. But what I did is I took these puzzles and I swapped some of the columns around and created this puzzle. Believe it or not, you can solve this puzzle exactly the same way. The little known rule that feels illegal, it's called Sudoku symmetry. And what it means is that you can swap columns. In this case, I swap this column with this column. And the puzzle will solve exactly the same way. You can swap columns within a 3x3 three three block. So I can swap this column with the blue column here or with this column right here in the same block. Either way, you have the, you'll do the same solve because you keep the integrity of the block, the columns, and then the rows, it doesn't matter. What I can't do is you cannot swap this column with this column here in another 3x3 three three block. If you do that, you ruin the integrity, and that's not allowed. Same thing with the rows. You can swap this row with this row right here. So you put the 976 up high, the 524 down there, puzzle will solve with the same logic, uh, and, and but the rows will just be swapped. You can swap it with the row below it, and that's okay. But you can't swap it with like this row down here in a different 3x3 three three block, or this row right here. That's not allowed by the symmetry. The other thing you can do with symmetry is you can actually swap entire three block bands or shoots. So you can take this whole three block right here and you could swap it with this three block band right here, swap them around and the puzzle will solve with the same logic. You could also swap it with this block right here. This is how Certain setters will create different finished grids by doing a little bit of symmetry. But by doing that, it gives you a feel of another puzzle. And you do it, solve it a little bit differently because your eyes are adjusting to something that looks a little bit different. And so, in this case, applying set equivalence theory might be a little bit harder than with what we saw in the original puzzle that Bonnie gave. But since you know all I did was swap these columns, I swapped this column with this column. I swapped this column with this column. And I swapped this column with this column right here. Since I just swapped all the columns, you know that the rows that we'd use for set equivalence theory will be exactly the same. And before I show you exactly how to apply set, I want to hear from you. Do you think Sudoku symmetry should be allowed? Please drop in the comments. Do you think what I just did seems illegal or shouldn't be allowed? You know, or it's not fair because in a paper and pencil puzzle, you can't maneuver the grid. 
I want to hear from you. Help me grow the internet's best Sudoku community. Share with the other viewers and me. So if we look back on this other Bondi puzzle, we saw that the rows should be the same because I didn't swap any of the rows. I just swapped the columns. So we'll capture most of the even cells in digits from the starting grid like that. Now you just got to capture those odd digits in the columns in the way I did the swap. Okay. So right here. And again, you're picking these columns based on where you see givens, mostly odd digits. Here, here, and here. All right. Put that in the red. Now, the cells that have the stripes are where the digits are exactly the same in both colored sets. So now I made larger sets. The red set is four sets of the digits, one through nine, and the green set is now five sets of the digits one through nine. So I'm going to call it the larger set, the red set and the green set. Where the location are the same, where you have the stripes, we, are, we know that the digits are the same. That doesn't give us any information to go off of. I mean, you would believe that you know, this cell is going to be the same in the red set as it is in the green set, just like this five is, because it's in both. We also have a mismatch. We have five green rows and only four red columns. So we notice that this is one whole complete set of the digits one through nine in green. So if you remove that, now you have four sets of the digits one through nine in green and four in the red, just like in the first two puzzles I did. And by set equivalence theory, we know that these digits in the red have to be somewhere in these green cells because they're exactly the same otherwise. And since you have ones, three, sevens, and nines in the red, but none in the green, and you have exactly eight empty cells, we know that this one, three, seven, nine has to be in these green cells because these digits have to fit somewhere in the green. That's what set equivalence theory shows you. Same thing, since you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight given even digits in the green, and you have eight empty cells in the red, and none of the givens are even, you know, the two, four, six, and eight, they got to fit in the red somewhere, they got to go there. And this is how you apply that set equivalence theory. Looks a little different than we've done the first two puzzles, but by using that symmetry, you saw how quickly we were able to come up with the two different sets. So now, the next step is to trim some of these cells down, right? So you got the two and the four right here and the two and the four right there. So the only place a two and a four can go now in block two is right here. So we can remove the six and the eight. You got this six, eight right here and you got this six, eight coming up here. So you know the six and eight are a hidden pair. They have to fit somewhere in block four. They're gonna be in those two cells. And then what's filled in here in the green, you know, that's the only possibility is that can be there, and we can trim that down a little further. The 1 and 9 look at this cell. The 1 and 9 look at this cell. So you know that you can remove 1s and 9s from there. And then the 3 and the 7 looks at that cell. 3 and the 7 looks at this cell. So you can remove 3s and 7s from right there. And then you have this 4 that looks at this 4 right there. Okay, so now... We've trimmed up and we're going to start doing some solving. We can remove the colors because your last step after you've trimmed up these cells is to solve the Sudoku normally. And now because we filled in these digits using set equivalence theory, you're going to be able to avoid most, if not all, of the advanced strategies puzzles. So let's see how the solving commences from here. All right. You can look at these fours right here, and you'll notice that there's only one place to put a four in block nine. And then with these two fours, two places for a four right there, so there's a restriction, I'll mark that in block six. And then with this four, a four can't be there anymore, you have a pointing pair of fours in block four. And so fours can't be anywhere else in the column outside the block, they have to fit in this block in that column. 
And with this 4 right here, now you can solve this cell for a 4, which allows you to disambiguate the 2 and the 4 right there. And so you can remove some of these marks, the 4 from there and the 2 from there. Okay, so far we're looking pretty good. Now look across row 6. You'll notice that a 4 can't be here, here, and here because of the set equivalence theory. It can't be here because of this 4, and it can't be here because of this 4. You can solve this cell now for a 4. It's a hidden single 4, and set allows you to do that. So you can remove the 4 from right there. You end up with a nice 6, 8 pair right there, and let's see what else we can do. You got these two 6s. Only place for a 6 in block 9 is right there. And now let's look across row 9 here. With this 5 and this 5, the only place to put a 5 in block 7 is right here in row 9. And then what you have left is a 1, 6, and a 9. Well, the 1 and the 6 see this cell. The 1 sees that. You can use my neat naked triple trick and solve all 3. This has to be your 9. The only place the 1 goes right there, and this is going to be your 6. Nice. And so you can remove the 6 from right here. And you can remove the 1 from right there. And the 9 from right here. Okay, after doing that, now where can we go? All right, you're looking at these sixes again. With this six and this six, you can solve for six in block two. And with these two sixes, solve for six here in block five, which allows you to disambiguate the eight and the six right there. And you can remove this mark. Awesome. All right. And then with these two sixes, you can solve for a six now in block one. That's the only place it can go. And we solved all the sixes. This leaves only two cells left here in column three. So that's got to be a two, three. And you'll see the one and the seven come down here. They can only fit in these two cells. So that's going to be a nice one, seven hidden pair. And so we'll mark that. Okay, now you want to look at these fives. This five cuts across here. Because a set, a five can't be there, so it's a nice pointing pair of fives here in block five. To go with this five and this five, you can solve for a five now in block eight. Okay? And then with these two nines, where can a nine go in block eight? It can only go right there. So you can solve that for a nine, which allows you to solve this for a one, solve this for a nine, and solve this cell now for an eight. You see how Set equivalence theory is working. You see how the symmetry got you going to look and see something that you recognized before? Awesome. All right. Now, after doing the block two there, let's look down column five. You got a one, four, five, six, seven, nine. You need a two, three, and an eight. Okay. And so with this eight right there, you know, this can be a 2 or a 3. With this 3, though, you can see that that's got to be your 3 right there. So that's your 2, and that's going to be your 8. And then you have just a 7, 8 right there. This ends up being a 1, 2, 8. I'm just going to show you, you know, with because of this 2, you now have a pointing pair of 2s right here. So I'll make a pointing pair. And with that too, so the twos are limited to these two cells right here. Okay, where can we go from here? So now look up here in the row one. You put the one and nine right there, so you can remove those. Creates a nice three, seven naked pair. So the only digit missing in row one is an eight. So that's got to be your eight right there, allowing you to solve this for a two. And then we have left the one and seven. Well, with this seven, that's a one, that's a seven, that's a one. Now we can clean up most of these digits. With this 7, this has got to be your 7 right there. That's got to be your 8. And then with this 3, that's a 2, that's a 3. Okay, and this 2 means this has to be your 2. And with this 8, this is going to be your 8, and that's going to be your 1. Nice. All right. And then with this 1, you know you can solve this for a 9, which is going to leave just a nice 3, 7 naked pair. And you'll notice here in column 7, now you have a 3, 7 naked pair. 3 and 7 can only go in these two orange cells. So you can use another neat naked triple trick right here. Since you have a 1, 2, 4, and 6 in the column, 3 and a 7 in a naked pair, you just need a 5, 8, and a 9. And since the 8 and 9 both see this cell, and the 8 repeats here, you can solve all three. 
This has to be your five. As soon as I get out of color mode, there's your five. I want to place the eight and goes right there, and this is going to be your nine. All right, let's remove those colors and see what else we can do with our solving. Because of this five now, you can displace that five, solve this cell for a five. And then with this seven cutting across, the only place to put a seven and block five is right there, which allows you to solve this for a three, solve that for a three, and disambiguate the seven and three right here. Nice. And then with these two sevens, you can solve this for a seven, solve this for a five. So as long as we're not encountering any problems, just continue setting. You know, continue the solving here and keep moving on. With these fives here, you can solve this for a five, leaving a nine in row three. And then you just have, looks like a one and a three here. I'll bring that three up, pull it on up from block nine. There's your three, there's your one. And with this one, that's got to be a one, displacing that four. Whenever I displace the can, I know I can solve the other cell right away. So there's a four right there. I don't see a two in block four. So there's your two. Displacing this two, so you can solve this for a two. And our last digit is a seven. You still have a problem understanding Sudoku symmetry? Well, watch this next video, and I'll show you how to apply it to another puzzle. Thank you so much for watching.